Hello everybody, this is the Victor and welcome to my extended review of uh, The Devil's Advocate. Here we go, shall we? And please note, spoiler alert. We're going to start with the ending of this movie and how I experienced it and why I think it is one of the greatest fucking things that I've ever seen. You know, I never actually thought that they were going to, you know, tell us that uh, John Milton was Kevin Lomax's father, even though many people probably saw that, you know, a mile away, but I did not see that thing and I was just so, oh my god, when they did that, you know, Kevin Lomax walks out of the hospital after Marianne kills herself after having, you know, seen that ghastly imagery in the mirror and stuff like that and, you know, the entirety of New York is just empty. You want to know, by the way, how they did that? Well, they shot that, you know, on a weekend where most New Yorkers were out, you know, on vacation and stuff like that. And they shot it on a Sunday morning, very early, and they had, you know, a wide section of uh, the, you know, Manhattan blocked out and then they removed digitally the things you might have seen beyond the blockade. That is why it looks so fucking good. It was planning and they only used the special effects very sparingly to uh, create the illusion. I love that sequence so, so much. One of the greatest images I've ever seen and experienced it for the first time. It was, whoa. So Kevin goes to John Milton's penthouse and, you know, confronts him and stuff like that. And, you know, he, you know, admits that he's being the devil. Oh, I have so many names. And he you know, tried to shoot him. A gun in here? As um, Pacino says, fucking great line and the delivery. And when he sees that, you know, bullets cannot defeat him. They have this fantastic showdown where uh, he tells him, you know, about the plan he has and that he wants to, you know, use his son to create, you know, some kind of an antichrist to uh, take over the world and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's insane, it's bonkers, but it sort of kind of works. Imagining, you know, people walking into this movie thinking it's just going to be, you know, one of these, you know, uh, courtroom drama things. Now they're stuck with this Hocus Pocus bullshit. I loved it. And Pacino's fantastic over delivery and overacting in this movie is absolutely fantastic. And here it goes into absolute overdrive. It is amazing. And his plan was always to, uh, you know, pair up um, Kevin Lomax with his sister, you know, Coney Nielsen. We'll get to her in a second. And as we know, Kevin has been wanting to boink her for quite a while now. So um, they're about to do it. And he, you know, tells, uh, you know, Al Pacino, it's got to be free will, right? It's a bitch, but, you know, it has to be that way. Says who, by the way. Anyway, it doesn't matter. And so Kevin then takes up the gun and uses the bullet to kill himself. He can't kill Milton and he won't kill Connie, but he can kill himself. When I saw that, I was like, oh my God. It's perfect because it redeems himself, it foils Satan's plan, and it made absolute sense. And it was so gorgeous. And the slow motion and the, you know, building up thing with the music and stuff like that. I was sitting there with goosebumps thinking this is one of the greatest fucking endings I've ever seen in my entire life. And then... He is transported back to the Florida courthouse where this whole thing begins with the Gettys case. When that happened, I felt a gasp of, oh shit, in the audience when I saw this on opening night in, back in 97. Or was it 98 that it had premiered in Sweden? I don't quite remember, but doesn't matter. Anyway, so... I was so angry. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I could not process the whole thing for a couple of seconds. And I thought, was this all a dream? What the fuck was that? And I immediately started to think about exactly how many points I was going to redact from this review. Uh, was it going to be 80 points or 90 points or whatever? This had 
contact levels of disappointment written all over itself. <clears throat> and we all know what happens next. He sees Getty, he knows that he's guilty. He sees Marianne and she's alive and, you know, not, you know, dead with, the, you know, her throat slit. And he makes a decision there and there. And he says that I cannot represent uh, Getty and uh, I'm, you know, not going to, you know, defend him anymore. And there is an uproar and there is a lot of stuff happening and, and there is a chance that he might, you know, be excommunicated from uh, the bar and stuff like that and that he cannot be a lawyer anymore. And then we have this um, random guy that we haven't paid that much attention to up until this point who, you know, is this lawyer guy, this local dude who says that this is a story that people need to know. Call me, you know, uh, in the morning and I'll make you famous. I'll, I will, you know, spread the word about, you know, that uh, you have a, you're a lawyer with a conscience. People need to know. And at first, Kevin is a bit, yeah, I don't know. But then the little bit of vanity that he does have creeps up to him and says, okay, I call you in the morning. He says, and then he walks off. And then you hear And I was like, what is going on here? And then he transforms into Al Pacino and says, Vanity, definitely my favorite scene. Ha 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 ha. And then we goes over to the end credits when we have painted black. I see a red door and it's happened painted black. And then I understand that Kevin Lomax is fucking screwed. And at that point, it went from me being the most disappointed and most disheartened I've ever been in a movie theater to I love this ending. It was even better than Kevin Lomax shooting himself in the head to, you know, not being um, responsible for, um, you know, uh, producing Satan's Spawn. It was magnificent. And if I ever do a list about, you know, the greatest endings of all time, this has definitely got to be one of the top five, I think. And this means that um, there is, this is an endless loop that Kevin Lomax is stuck in, that uh, no matter what he does, no matter how many times he tries to fix this, the devil can go back and uh, fix whatever he, you know, didn't fix the last time and, you know, make sure that eventually he's going to get Lomax and he's going to get his devil spawn thing. We don't get to see that because we never got a, you know, sequel to this, which I'm happy with because now it is sort of an open ending that he might, you know, be successful the next time. But what about the entire time after that? How many times have the devil actually done this? Is this, you know, his first attempt or is this his 16th attempt? We don't know. I think that is the reason why I think this ending was so amazing. There are probably a lot of people who absolutely hated this ending and it is maybe a little cheap. Maybe it is, or that it absolutely makes no sense or that it feels pointless or anything like that. But for me, for me, I love this ending so, so much and I think it is so incredibly great. Wardrobes and haircuts as storytelling devices. So, there is a movie called The Cooler. I think it was made in 2003, starring William H. Macy as the most unlucky man in the history of ever. And he, you know, works at a casino. He has, you know, so bad luck that he actually transforms his bad luck onto other people so that they, you know, keep losing on um, Alec Baldwin's casino. The thing is that he starts to get lucky and loses his ability to make people lose their money. This is told through the uh, very, very clever act of wardrobes because in the beginning of the movie where um, Macy has no luck at all. He's wearing a suit that is two sizes too big for him. Then when he starts to get a little bit more lucky, the suit fits him better and it is, you know, just one size too big for him. And when he starts to get really lucky, he's wearing a suit that is tailor-made for him and uh, he just keeps winning. It is the same color of the whole thing, but it just fits him better and makes him, you know, a little bit cooler and have a little bit more swag. It is great storytelling. They basically do a similar thing in The Devil's Advocate because through the movie, if you look very closely, you can see that um, Kevin Lomax starts out with his very, you know, uh, light gray suits. And throughout the movie, 
he will, you know, gradually turn into more dark, dark, and until he goes completely black because it is slowly corrupting him, uh, the influence of John Milton. And I thought that that was a really clever way of showing the moral deterioration of uh, Kevin Lomax's character. And we also have another th thing that I never really quite figured out until I watched this movie the last time, and that is the uh, thing where Al Pacino tells Marianne that you should, you know, uh, change your uh, hair and stuff like that, wear it in a different way and stuff like that. And I never figured out why he, that sequence existed. I didn't understand why he did that, but I kind of understood this the last time I saw it. The thing is that he must present Coney Nielsen as a more attractive uh, partner for uh, Kevin as opposed to uh, Marianne. So when she starts looking less like herself and when Christabella aka Coney Nielsen starts to look more like what Marianne used to look like, it you know just drives him even more into her arms. I thought that was a really clever way of doing it because it is tricky to try to make a 21 year old Charlie Theo and look unattractive, but they did their best, damn it. And I thought it was a very clever way of doing it. I never really thought about it that way, and I always thought that this was a little bit of a weird way of, you know, having um, Marianne interact with John Milton, but I know now that that was the point of the whole thing. The demons are in Marianne's head. Well, almost. One thing that I thought that they did in The Devil's Advocate that was really, really clever is the fact that whenever Marianne sees these, you know, demons and ghastly figures and, you know, stuff like that, it is just her seeing it. There are no other characters who sees it. Well, obviously it is because everybody else in this movie is essentially, you know, working for John Milton and is actively trying to break her mind with this thing and, you know, having her institutionalized and making uh, Kevin Lomax believe that uh, his wife is going insane. The thing is that I love that little detail that nobody else sees this demon. Well, there is just one scene where I think that they could have done this a little bit differently. The fantastic sequence when uh, John Milton is, you know, talking about Eddie Barzoon. You're all alone, Eddie. He has this great fucking monologue. And um, Eddie Barzoon is just, you know, running around and, you know, jogging in Manhattan. And then we see these guys that are, you know, following him disappearing as, you know, they're following him and, and he just goes, ah, and, you know, start running even faster. And then they beat the ever-loving shit out of him outside of, you know, Marianne's apartment. And, and she sees them. And when they, you know, kills Eddie Barzoon, they, you know, go a little bit, and we see them, you know, with the demon faces. Uh, that is great. But I just wish that they could have done this so that we just would have seen Marianne's point of view where she sees that Eddie Barsoon is being beaten to death by demons and not that we see that Eddie Barsoon sees that, you know, demons and stuff like that and people who are disappearing are, you know, following him. I thought that that was a thing that they could have done just a little bit better because apart from that, all this spookery pokery that is going on here is essentially just what Marianne sees. We will, you know, find out later that, well, it was actually, actually happening. But up until that point, you can make an argument that everything that Marianne sees might just be a case of that she's going insane. And I thought that they could have played around with it even more. Now, they didn't do that, and that is totally fine, but they could have actually made this movie even better if they could have, you know, played around a little bit more with it. The book. So I found the book that this movie is sort of kind of based on, The Devil's Advocate, uh, a few years after the movie had been made, and I was kind of curious. I wonder how, how good is this book? How much, you know, have they taken, you know, from the original story, and uh, how is the source material compared to this book? So I started reading it, and I was like, well, this is not very good, and this is kind of clunky and I don't understand a thing about this. I mean, the characters are there. Kevin Lomax is there and John Milton is there. And, you know, there was this get this case thing, even though in that movie it is a woman that he defends that uh, was supposed to have uh, been, you know, 
uh, molesting this uh, student and stuff like that. And um, the movie kind of ends in in a way that I at least figured out that uh, that uh, he is sort of sent into a some kind of bureaucratic hell. Uh, Kevin Lomax, that is, and he has to work now for John Milton doing this weird building. I didn't understand a thing. It was so abstract, it was so clunkily told, and I didn't understand a thing. But when I read this thing, uh, and when I you know, started reading about uh, you know, John Milton, how he is described in that book, do you know what I didn't think uh, was a good casting choice? Do you know who I thought was going to be a great uh, John Milton if he would have you know, made this you know, based more upon how he is in the book rather than how he is in the movie? And that would have been Liam Neeson because he is this sort of you know, big hulking and slightly threatening but very mellow uh, man. And I didn't see you know, energetic and totally insane Al Pacino in that role but that's what we got for the uh, adaptation of this book and thank god we got that because as I said in my review this just might be one of the greatest adaptations I've ever seen considering that the book is mediocre at best and uninspiring at worst and they took this mundane very uninteresting book uh, that was hard to follow and had little to nothing to do with the movie they, they made, even though you can see that they have picked up different things throughout the whole thing. And they turned this into an absolute juggernaut of a movie, in my opinion, of course. But as I said, has there ever been a better adaptation if you're thinking in that way? I can't come up with a single movie that did that, maybe except Starship Troopers, which basically took, you know, some uh, you know, characters and some elements from Robert A. Heinlein's uh, book and just turn that into something completely different. And since uh, Starship Troopers is a better movie than uh, The Devil's Advocate, maybe that is the better adaptation, but maybe that's a story for another time. But do not read the book, it absolutely 100% sucks. Casting a remake. Do I want a remake of uh, The Devil's Advocate? No, I do not want a remake to The Devil's Advocate. The movie is perfect as it is. And I don't want a you know, sequel, I don't want a reboot, I don't want anything. But if I would um, cast what a remake of The Devil's Advocate would look like. Now in the director's chair, I would have played you know, somebody like Jorgos Lantimos or Denis de Neville or you know, some uh, director like that. And if you're going to you know, do a remake about this, I think that a person like Andrew Garfield would be a perfect um, Kevin Lomax. And um, Marianne, I think I would go for a Anna uh, Taylor-Joy. And that is not just because I want them to re reenact that sequence, that sequence, and that sequence. Or maybe it is a little, but anyway, she's one of the greatest actors working today. So uh, she would be a perfect uh, version of Marianne. Christabella would, of course, be uh, Margot Robbie. But who would play John Milton? And I've been thinking about this for a while, and it was not until I saw the movie The Killer recently with Michael Fassbender as it became clear to me. Michael Fassbender as uh, uh, John Milton. Why? Simply because he's one of the greatest actors ever. And the thing is that he would take on this role and he would make him into this charming but super menacing entity that we would fear and that we would be legitimately scared of. We're never scared of Pacino. He's hilarious and we love him and we want him to keep doing his We're coming out! Guns blazing! And stuff like that. Fassbender wouldn't do that. He would, you know, look menacing at you and he would say We're coming out. And you're going to suffer for it. Or something like that. I, I, I don't know how to write a thing that would, you know, be a similar thing to this, that thing. But if I would do a, in a remake, that is how I would um, cost it. Maybe you could, you could do something else, but, but that is spontaneously what I think would be a good uh, remake uh, casting for a movie like The Devil's Advocate. And that is all for today. What is your favorite little uh, trivia thing about The Devil's Advocate? Comment below and I'll see you next time for well so and so reviewing well such and such. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much.